Hi guys, here we are. <clears throat> Not City of Ember, but the follow-up book, The People of Sparks. Today we were just reading, <clears throat> pardon me, chapter 6, Breakfast with Disaster, and we got as far as page 66, so if you'll join me there, we'll pick right back up where we left off. And so as you recall, Lena is figuring out what an egg is, what a chicken and an egg is, and Torin, wanting that egg all to himself, shoved Lena. Lena, not understanding what the deal is with eggs, threw it at him, and it smashed all over him. Now look what you've done, Torin screamed. It's ruined! And he put his head down as if to run at Lena and headbutt her. But the doctor grabbed his arm. Stop this! Lena was horrified disgusted too. That yellow goop was something people ate? Ugh. She was glad she didn't have to, but she felt stupid for what she'd done. I'm sorry I wrecked the eggs, she said. I didn't know what it was. Well, you wrecked my shirt too, shouted Torin, wriggling in the doctor, doctor's grasp. Yeah, but you pushed me, Lena said. Well, yes, said the doctor in a weary voice. That's how it goes, doesn't it? Someone pushes, someone pushes back, and pretty soon everything's ruined. Everything, said Lena, but can't his shirt be washed? Oh, yes, of course, said the doctor. I didn't mean that. Uh, never mind. She let go of Torn. I guess we'll have bread and apricots for breakfast. Some people call them apricots. They're like little, almost like baby peaches. They're a... They're a a stone fruit like that. They'll have like a little pit inside. Mrs. Murdo had come downstairs now, leaving the still sleeping Poppy in bed. They all had breakfast together. Lena ate five apricots. She loved them for their taste and the feel for them too. Their rosy orange skins were velvety like a baby's cheek. She also liked the bread, which was toasted and crunchy, and the jam, ooh, which was dark purple and sweet. Mrs. Murdo kept saying, Mm, my, this is tasty, and asking questions about what bread was made of and what a blackberry looked like and why apricots had a sort of wooden rock in the middle. Dr. Hester seemed a bit flummoxed. That means a bit confused and out of sorts. Seemed a bit flummoxed by these questions, but she did her best to explain. She was nice, Lena decided, but distracted. Her mind seemed to be elsewhere. She didn't notice that Torin was putting all of his apricot pits into his pocket, for instance, or maybe she just didn't care. When breakfast was over, Torin went up to the loft and came back down carrying a bulging bag. These are my things, he said loudly. I don't want anyone touching them. He knelt down and opened the doors of the cabinet under the window seat and thrust the bag inside. Casper gave them to me and anyone who touches them will get in big trouble. He closed the cabinet doors and glared at Lena. What an awful boy, Lena thought. How could nice Dr. Hester have such a horrid son? Lena had thought that she'd go back to the plaza and find Dune right after breakfast, but she changed her mind when she went upstairs to waken her little sister. Poppy seemed so sick that Lena was frightened. She didn't want to leave her. She brought her downstairs, and all that morning Poppy lay on the couch, sometimes sleeping, sometimes wailing, sometimes just lying much too still with her mouth open and her breath coming in short gasps. Lena and Mrs. Murdo sat on either side of her, putting cool cloths on her forehead and trying to get her to drink water and the medicine that the doctor provided. I don't know what's causing this child's fever, the doctor said. All I can do is just try to bring it down. After all the walking of the days before, Lena was glad to sit still. She settled into a corner on the couch, her legs tucked under her, and watched the doctor dither about. She seemed to have a hundred things to do and a hundred things on her mind. She'd stand for a second staring into the air, murmuring to herself, now, all right, oh, first I must look up, mm, and then dart over to some enormous book and shuffle through its pages. After a second or two, she'd suddenly set the book down and hurry off to the kitchen, where she would take a bottle of liquid or a jar of powder down from a shelf and measure some of it into a pot. 
or she'd dash out to the garden and come back with an armload of onions, or she'd vanish out to the back door and appear again with a sheaf of dried stems or leaves. It was hard to tell what she was doing or if she was really accomplishing anything at all. Every now and then, when, then she, sorry, every now and then she would come back to Poppy and uh, spoon some of that medicine into her mouth or put a cold, damp cloth to her forehead. What is that enormous book? Lena asked her. Oh, said the doctor. She always seemed a little startled when spoken to. Well, it's about medicine. A lot of it's useless, though. She picked up the book from the floor and rifled through its pages. You look up infection and it says, prescribe antibiotics. What are antibiotics? Or you look up fever and it says, give aspirin. Aspirin is some kind of painkiller, I think, but we don't have it. Oh, we had we had aspirin and ember, said Mrs. Murdo rather proudly, although I do believe it had rather uh, nearly run out by the end. Is that so, said the doctor. Well, what we have here, plants, we have herbs, roots, funguses, that sort of thing. I have a couple of old books that tell about which ones to use. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. She ran a hand through her short, wiry hair, making it poke out on one side. So much to know, she said, and so much to do. Her voice trailed off. Well, I suppose your son is a help to you, said Mrs. Murdo. My son? Yes, the boy, Torin. Oh, said Dr. Hester, he's not my son. He's not? said Lena. No, 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 the doctor said. Torin and his brother, Casper, they're my sister's boys. They live with me because their parents were killed in an avalanche years ago. They were in the ma mountains on an ice-gathering trip. And the boy has no other relatives? asked Mrs. Murdo. Well, he has an uncle, said the doctor, but the uncle didn't want the trouble of bringing up the boys. He offered to have this house built for me if I'd take them on, the doctor, doctor shrugged. So I did. What's an avalanche? Lena asked. And what are mountains? Lena, said Mrs. Murdo, it's not polite to ask too many questions. Oh, I don't, I don't mind, the doctor said. I, I forgot you don't know such things. You really lived underground? Yes, said Lena. Dr. Hedster scrunched her gray eyebrows together. But why would there be a city underground? Lena said that she didn't know. All she knew was what was in her notebook she and Dune had found on their way out. It was a journal kept by one of, its first, one of the first inhabitants of Ember, who told of the fifty couples brought in from the outside world, each with two babies to raise in the underground city. Well, they thought they were in some sort of danger, Lena said. They made Ember as a place to keep people safe. Oh, it was a long time ago then, said the doctor, before the disaster. Oh, I, I don't know, said Lena. I, I guess so. What disaster? The disaster that just about wiped out the human race, said Dr. Hester. I'll tell you about it sometime, but not now. I, I have to go and see about, uh, see to Bert Webb's infected finger. C can I ask one more question, said Lena. The doctor nodded. Why is this place called Sparks? Oh, said the doctor, smiling a little. It was, the, it was the people of the last truck who gave it that name, our 22 founders. They were among the very few people who survived the disaster. For a while, they, fa they found food by driving around from one place to another in the old towns, using cars and trucks that had a sort of energy-making stuff inside of them called ga gasoline. Anyway, gas for short. Cars and trucks, thought Lena. Gasoline? But she didn't want to interrupt, so she didn't ask. When food and gas began to run out, the doctor went on, they decided it was time to start a new life somewhere else. They found one last truck that still had gas. They loaded it up with supplies. Food and cans and boxes, tools and clothes and blankets and seeds and everything useful anyone could find. And then they drove east, out across the empty lands, staying close to the river. Right here, the truck 
broke down. And when they opened a hood, a great spray of sparks shot up out of the engine. So they decided to settle in this spot, and they named it Sparks. The doctor stood up and looked around for her medicine bag. It turned out to be fi a fitting name in another way. She said, Sparks are a beginning. We are the beginning of something here, or trying to be, the way a spark is the beginning of a fire. Oh, oh, but fires are terrible, said Lena. <laughs> terrible or wonderful, said the doctor, who had found her bag behind a chair and was headed out the door. It can go either way. Lena never did go down to the plaza that day. She didn't think Dune would worry. He knew Poppy was sick, and he'd figure out that Lena had stayed with her. She would go back and look for him tomorrow, she decided, and find out then what was happening to the people of Ember. Late in the afternoon, Lin Lena went outside and sat on a rickety bench in the courtyard of the doctor's house, waiting to see if anyone was going to make dinner. Seemed unlikely. The doctor was off treating someone's toothache, and Mrs. Murdo was up in the loft with Poppy, who had started crying an hour ago and still had not stopped. A door opened and Torin came from outside. He sauntered over to Lena and stood in front of her. Your sister's probably going to die he said. Lena jerked back. <gasps> she is not! Torrin shrugged. Looks like it to me, he said. Looks like to me she has the plague. He sat down on a wooden chair where he could stare straight into Lena's face. He was wearing sort of a sort of an undershirt. It was white and it looked like a sack with holes for neck and arms. And his thin legs stuck out from baggy shorts made of the same material. He had combed his hair so that it looked like a tuft of grass at the top of his forehead, making his long, narrow face look even longer. I don't know what you're talking about, Lena said. Uh, you don't know about the three plagues, said Torin in a tone of exaggerated surprise, or the four wars. You've never heard of the disaster? I mean, I've heard of it, said Lena, but I don't know what it is. I don't know about anything here. Well, then I'll tell you, he said. You can't go around being so ignorant. She said nothing. She didn't like this boy's superior attitude, but she wanted to know everything there was to know. She would let him tell her, but she wasn't going to ask him to. Well, it was a long time ago, he said. He spoke in a precise teacherly voice. There were millions of people in the world then. They were all geniuses. They could make their voices travel around the world, and they could see people who were miles away. They could fly. What do you think he means there? Think about our lives now. Can we make our voices travel around the world? I'm doing it right now. Could you see people who were miles away? I'm doing it right now. And they could fly. I hope to do that this summer in an airplane. He paused, waiting, no doubt, for Lena to be amazed. She was amazed, but she wasn't going to show it. Besides, he was probably lying, so she just nodded. They could make music come down out of the air. Radio. They had thousands of smooth roads and could go anywhere they wanted, like really fast. They had pictures that moved. Like videos and movies? He waited again. He took a few apricot pits from his pocket and rattled them idly in the palm of his hand. All right, she would ask. What do you mean, pictures that moved? Didn't think you'd know that one, <laughs> Torrance said with a tight little smile. They were like huge pictures, like taller than a house, and they were called movies. You'd look at a wall and see a story happening on it with, the, with voices and other sounds. How do you know all this? asked Lena. She thought he might easily be making it up. We learn it in school, said Torin. They teach us a lot about the old times, you know, like so we don't forget. Have you seen a moving picture then? Of course not, he said. You have to have electricity. There hasn't been any of that for a long time. 
He chucked one of the pits at the bird that he was about to a bird that was about to drink from the water dish. The splash scared it away. We had electricity, Lena said, glad to score a point over on him. We had it in Ember, well, I mean, until it ran out. We had street lights and lamps in our houses and electric stoves in the kitchen. For a moment, Torrin looked dismayed. Yeah, but did you have movies, he said. Lena shook her head. Well, anyway, she said, what does all this have to do with my sister? I'm about to tell you if you just let me. The important tone came back to his voice. <clears throat> so, there are all these billions of people, but there got to be too many of them. They like, messed up the world. That was why the three plagues came. But before the three plagues, they had the four wars. Once again, he pushed and he paused rather and looked at her in that infuriating way, lifting up his thin eyebrows. Just tell me, she said. Don't look at me like that. You don't know about the four wars? No. War. What is that? War is when a bunch of people fights with another bunch and then both of them, like when both of them want the same thing. Like, for instance, if there's some good land and two groups of people want to live there. Well, why can't both live there? Because they don't want to live there together, he said, as if this were a stupid question. Also, you could have a war because of revenge. So, let's say, like, one group of people does something bad to another group, like, you know, steal their chickens. Then, the first group does something bad back in revenge. That could start a war. The two groups would try to kill each other, and the ones who killed the most would win. They'd kill each other over chickens? <sighs> it's just an example. Like, in the four wars, they were fighting over bigger things, like who should get some big chunk of land, or whether you should believe in this god or that god, or who got to have gold and the oil. That sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? All of this was enormously confusing to Lena. She didn't know the meaning of the word God or gold, and she wasn't sure what they meant by oil. You mean, she said, thinking of the jars that had once been stocked in the storerooms of Ember, like the kind of oil you cook with? Torn rolled his eyes. Ugh, you really don't know anything, he said. He flung the rest of his pits he was holding at the three little red-headed birds pecking at the weeds between the bricks and the birds scattered, cheeping. This was really beautiful, valuable oil. Like, everybody wanted it, and there wasn't enough of it to go around, so they fought over it. They hit each other? Mmm, much worse than that, said Torin. He leaned forward, elbows on his knees and in a low husky voice told Lena about the weapons they had had in those days. The guns that let you kill people without even get, getting near them, and the bombs that could flatten and burn whole cities at once. They set cities on fire like all over the world, Torrin said, and his small eyes glittered. And afterwards came the plagues. I don't know what a plague is, Lena said. A sickness said Torin, the kind where one person catches it from another person and it spreads around fast before you can even stop it. Oh, well, we had one of those, Lena said, the coughing sickness. It would come sometimes and kill a lot of people and then go away again. We had three, said Torin, as if three plagues were better than one. There was the one where you would wither away like you were starving to death. The one where you feel like you're on fire and die of heat. And then the one where you suddenly can't breathe. No one knew where they came from. They just rose up and swept around the world like a wind. Lena shuddered. She was tired all at once of listening to Torrin, who took such pleasure in describing the horrors and saying words that she didn't understand. So, said Torrin, the four wars and the three plagues, those together were the disaster. When it was finally over with, hardly any people were left. That's why they had to start all over again. She stood up and brushed away a twig that was clinging to his shorts. We don't have war anymore, he said. Our leaders say, like, we must never have war again. And besides, well, there's no one to fight against. But if we ever do have one, we'll win. 
because we have the terrible weapon. The terrible weapon, said Lena. What's that? But just then, Mrs. Murdo came out of the door with Poppy in her arms. Lena jumped up and ran over to her. Is she better? She's a little better. Poppy lay against Mrs. Murdo's shoulder and her, with her head turned sideways, her eyes dull. Weena, she said in a small voice. Lena ruffled her fine brown hair. Torin cast an indifferent glance at Mrs. Murdo and walked away across the courtyard. The gate clattered behind him. Poppy doesn't have the plague, does she? Lena said. A plague? Certainly not, said Mrs. Murdo. Whatever gave you that idea? That boy, said Lena. That horrible boy. And that, my friends, is chapter six. Hope you had enjoyed it, and hope you enjoyed it rather, and I look forward to seeing you in chapter seven. Adios, amigos.